Hi there, I'm David Starkey, host of The Creative Community. After nine years, we're going to a new format. From now on, we'll be on site, meeting the artists in their place of residence and their place of work. Our new format will feature three to four guests each episode. Each episode will be an hour long and will air once a month. We hope you like the new format. The Creative Community is brought to you in part by a generous grant provided by the Diana and Simon Rabb Foundation. guest of the day is Michael Fish Fisher, artist and photographer. Let's head over to Muddy Waters Cafe and meet Fish. Fish, welcome. He said, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, I'm glad to have you. We're sitting out in the courtyard of uh, Muddy Waters Cafe. Um, inside, your uh, work is all over the place. All over the place. A lot of frames. A lot of frames, yeah. And and it's it's really interesting work. Um, it's it's work that is done on the, these blackberries. I'll show the, the camera, and I know you'll talk about them later on. But before we get to that, um, just give me a, a couple of minutes overview of how you became an artist because I know you've got it you went to Stanford you did uh, design for theater you worked as a handyman how did you become a, an art photographer uh, an, an art uh, I consider myself an artist first uh, a photographer is just part of the of how you do panoply it. of uh, uh, talents okay. as it were but uh, uh, my background uh, was in theaters uh, and I discovered that I had no career uh, in, in front of the, the stage lights or the footlights, but rather behind the scenes. I enjoyed uh, building things, painting, uh, the lighting aspects. So that all fed into uh, kind of my art, art bent, mm -hmm. as it were. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've, always, I, I've been doing uh, art in various forms you know, as a, you know, all my life, but really since I was a, a teenager, um, sometimes uh, more active. I have a large family, so art kind of took a, a back seat mm -hmm. to, you to have raising five kids. five kids, all named after American presidents. You don't hear that very often. No, no, no. Th <laughs> theme kids, as it were, and uh, they, can, uh, you know, the the viewers can go through the you know, their history book and try to figure out <laughs> what has strong name value. But, uh, you know, the uh, art photography really came about uh, kind of as a, as a fluke. Um, I, uh, in 2008, was caretaking a rather remote house in Toro Canyon. Uh, there was no television, no internet, uh, no telephone. And so I uh, went to uh, the cell phone store and got uh, this uh, 2008 Blackberry Curve uh, to communicate with the, the outside world. world yeah. The outside world. I, had a, uh, I worked in the theater uh, in France as a young man and still am in touch with uh, uh, friends there. So, was, you know, email was active. And I discovered that uh, part of the fun of this. Uh, was there was a camera on it. Yeah. So I started doing self self portraits. You know, it was very easy to just you know <laughs> like this and like this. I learned you know you can tell now anytime somebody does a self portrait, their arm raises up and it's uh, looking like, like that. Yeah. So I figured, okay, I'm gonna drop my shoulder and it'll look like somebody. Else. So I practiced driving the car. Dry, so you know, <laughs> it, it it looked like somebody Someone else was doing. Yeah, yeah. I was having a ball. I went to Paris to visit with friends, and I was doing self-portraits, you know, the Eiffel Tower is a hat, and uh, walked across a, a bit of street graffiti that said in French, somebody loves you, quelqu'un t'aime. 
And I thought, this is so cool. This is kind of a sign. Somebody loves me. So I took a picture of the graffiti. As, uh, as like many of us would do. Oh, oh that's absolutely. A cool thing uh, you know, I graffiti. speak French, yeah. so I just went, what a, what a coin, coincidenza. Um, took a picture of it, looked at it, and just went, cool graffiti, but there was Where's no, the no yeah. context. Yeah. Where's the picture? So I had um, my first pair of uh, now uh, infamous or famous um, work boots. I uh, stuck them in the picture, kind of got the balance. You know, I was used to scenic design, so there's kind of you know this and that. S you know, snapped. I guess you know whatever, whatever the one does whatever the, the digital. Bear. Yeah, yeah. Because it's not <laughs> photography now; it's digital images. Um, and uh, looked at it with my boots, kind of framing the the graffiti and just went bingo yeah. so for the next you know three or four days you know it's sat in my pocket it was easy to use anything i saw that was cool i could just whip it out and, and were you taking photos of your boots and around well, Paris? what what happened then is anything that was nice on the sidewalk i started to down shoot you know there's a lot of uh and i found there's uh, graffiti rich towns and towns that are less graffiti uh paris has uh uh, you know, some writing, but they do a lot of this kind of action whitewash. So there's kind of these abstract things. I would shoot it with my boots and without my boots with the intention of uh, painting it in the future. I'm a painter. You know, I'm nice big abstract canvases. And each one I looked at, the boots kind of gave it an, another uh, significance. So I, I, I just started to do no separate, just boots. And the more I did it, the more I, th I thought, well, you know, it, it became a signature. Mm -hmm. yeah. It became a witness to a moment. No matter how uh, abstract or surreal or gritty or textural it was, how, how you know, uh, seemingly fabricated, my boots were always there. Mm -hmm. And it proved that I was there. It also, as an artist, gave me uh, a design challenge. Mm -hmm. How do you work your boots? Right. You know, how, do you, do you know, they go on the right if there's this thing. Do we want the little tips? You know, do I want my pant leg? And so it, again, it, it uh, you know, with a, a piece of kind of you know digital equivalent of a, a, of a Kodak, Kodak inst camera, yeah, Instamatic, exactly, yeah. a brownie. Um, it, it gave me. A, a, a challenge and as go ahead no I was gonna say I mean w w what I think probably viewers are thinking is okay I well probably not too many people have a Blackberry right, but you know right. I have a droid or I yeah. have an iPhone I take pictures all the time what what's the difference between the good pictures that I take um, and and the good pictures that you take I mean because you're giving us a really interesting sort of intellectual yeah. overlay about how the, the photos come into being, but um, what what's what what would you say differentiates the the, the work that we have on the wall there, Lady Waters, from just that's, somebody that's else? That's a very good question. I haven't really given it a lot of thought, but what I started to discover is I would take uh, uh, photographs of very uh, mundane things, mon mundane object crosswalks, uh, little bits of uh, painted curb. Um, and all of a sudden, they would be reminiscent of, uh, you know, the famous abstract artists. You know, the the Diebenkorns. Um, you know, there, there's guys who would do. You know, Joseph Albers would do. You know, these uh, squares. So you're referencing so art I, history. So I, yeah, I right. referenced art history, but I also created my own art history. I mean, one of our uh, the top, the most popular. I'm going to say the top seller. The most popular. It's this you know, kind of textural, big chunk of yellow, and there's a, a streak of red and some white. It's a crosswalk at a San Francisco Trader Joe's. It was brilliant sunlight, so everything was kind of reflective. Um, and I thought thousands of people come out of Trader Joe's, walk over this every day, and I would say two or three people have ever looked down and thought, That's wow, cool. this is really cool. Uh, exactly, the one exactly. Who's actually taken the, yeah, the, yeah, the exactly. Image. So I mean, it, uh, you know, it's it's portions of stuff. I discovered uh, I was in a friend's house in uh, uh, Los Angeles, and they had this wrought iron gate in the 
the shadows were, were coming through and I, I snapped that, you know, always with the boots and it was so romantic and mysterious. You know, I ended up calling it two hours late. You know, it was like, is this guy standing outside the gate? Is he inside the gate? Where is he? But these shadows just um, gave it kind of a, uh, a timely and timeless feel. Um, you know, as we're, as we're talking here, I, I would love to uh, uh, have you show, walk us through some individual uh, okay. uh, photos. So we can throw these up um, uh, to our viewers, but um, we're just kind of looking at, at the fish footage right. uh, uh, website. Um, just uh, as, as you see an image, tell me something about it. Okay, so. now, um, for example, uh, you know, when I, I came back from Paris, uh, Actually, I uh, 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 came back to Santa Barbara and just started discovering how kind of rich Santa Barbara was in, in ground stuff. Um, I, I was at the Mission. I, I kind of started to walk around. I thought, oh, the Mission will be a cool spot. Uh, there was an open doorway in, in the Mission, and I knew it was an open doorway. I took a picture of the boots, the, the, the open doorway, the corridor outside. And when I looked at it, all of a sudden, if I could flatten it out, you know, my boots are really the only reference point that it is uh, dimensional. All it was was uh, colorful shapes. And I thought, this is, this is really cool. So then I, again, I started looking for something that would, uh, I could extract kind of pure form and color. Um, there's one, we call it uh, Big Blue Dog, mm -hmm. I took in uh, San Luis Obispo. And it's an open doorway. You can see a little bit of the open door. Brilliant blue. Mm -hmm. Uh, kind of step up a threshold and uh, the there was this mat that was flipped over so it kind of black and uh, and so and texture brown. is clearly something that oh texture always, oh texture uh, I always look and, and you know there's uh, uh, I, I think the I, I call it pandering the the wildly colorful stuff you know is is popular but I do like to take uh, pictures of you know gritty streets you know the black and white the the bots dots, um, you know, have an, a number of, uh, you know, there's one, you know, we, I call it, you know, uh, favorite, you know, junky curb or something um, that, you know, it's a nice, nice bit of blue. The truncated domes, um, you know, the, that uh, actually are uh, for uh, visually impaired mm -hmm. people so they know they're, and they're all over the place. Uh, I live up on the Mesa one. I did Mesa Corner, you know, it's kind of blue with pink. Another one I did in San Francisco, very simple, uh, pink truncated domes with a big red streak coming across and white concrete squares. So it, it, very yeah. geometric. And yeah, but you're talking a lot about color, as though you were an abstract painter. It, well, yeah. again, I mean, the original intention was to paint them, paint them large. And then I, you know, I would look at the photos and go, why? The photos? Paint it? I've <laughs> yeah, already done yeah, it. Yeah. So uh, now, you know, I, I don't really have to hunt. You know, there's, there's certain cities, uh, New York, uh, you know, is rich, San Francisco rich, Ventura, uh, you know, and what I'll do is I'll go behind, uh, again, like theater behind the nice facades to where you know the garbage the cans are yeah, right. exactly. Um, you know, it's funny. I uh, have 2,000 of the 2,450 Hollywood Walk of Stars, and I was down on Hollywood Boulevard. I figure, what's the time there is no tourist? And uh, Sunday morning, so I was out shooting, and the Denisons are really out on Hollywood. You know, the, not the not the tourists. The people know, who live there. The yeah. people who live there. And when I would get bored of shooting the stars, I'd walk down the alley and go to, you know, where the valves, where obviously, you know, people went to the bathroom the night before on Saturday night, or, you know, it's you know, just gritty and, you know, even from the photos, you can almost smell, you know, the humanity as it were. But uh, now things call to me. I'll be driving in, in a vehicle and, you know, just kind of look at, uh, oh, 
this curb is so brilliant. You, know, you just pull over. I'll just pull <laughs> over. Out the you know, um, sometimes uh, it becomes dangerous. You know, there's something in the middle of the street. Um, I, I know when I was in Paris the first time, I just got so involved and, uh, you know, started hearing it honking. And, and I looked up and, you know, there is like this crowd of people, you know, angry that this, you know, insane person was in the middle of the street, you know, with my thing and uh, uh, doing that. But um, really, you know, uh, again, once you start to, to, to look at it, uh, you know, I mean, it's every, well, that, I it's, think it's that, would, that, that would, that it would explain it, this, the everywhere. sort of series, like you're saying, yeah. the, the Hot Rod series, Hollywood yeah. Yeah. Uh, Boulevard series. And, and you know, you're you're obviously very serious and thoughtful about the work, but you, you have a, a, a sense of humor, especially well, it, in the know, titles, for instance. Right. It's right. fish footage, fish and footage, you know, there's, it's, your, it's, there's a it's pun, pun on your boots. It's filled you know, again. The Driveway Tsunami, yeah, yeah, that's exactly. one of my favorite Yeah, Driveway Tsunami is actually, you know, I I submitted that. They had a call for artists at the Maritime Museum. And I submitted it, you know, there's the pictures of the sailboats and the waves, and I thought, well, you know, this kind of looks like a tsunami rolling through. Went there, uh, met, you know, some photographer's friends, went to another opening, and uh, my friend called me up and said, Fish, you won. <laughs> and I said, you know, won what? And uh, he and said- is this your driveway? No, 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 just it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a client's driveway. driveway. Yeah. Actually, this client, uh, uh, it was rich in abstraction. I have a series of about 12. You know, I just started to look all over, you know, everywhere. But, mine, yeah. but the driveway, you know, I ended up uh, thanking the judges uh, for, you know, giving me this award. Uh, when I get a box of chocolates and a membership to the Maritime <laughs> Museum. That's well, pretty expensive. It was great. Um, <laughs> But uh, I also thank the judges for having open mind. It had nothing to do with water. Basically, it was a calcium stained uh, uh, indentation in a client's driveway. And again, I mean, you start to look at what is mundane and without kind of the overall context, it, it becomes something new. Mm -hmm. And again, I think, you know, with, uh, you know, a pun, a photo, Always, it takes what what is expected, what is simple, and changes. You're a, you're a poet, you know, uh, uh, taking words and and putting them in a, you a different them context. Out of their exactly, context. and That's and right, they yeah. become you know meaningful. Exactly, exactly. Right. So again, I think um, what what I you know it's it's interesting talking to uh, you know. Uh, a fellow artist, really, I would consider you a, an artist who understands, you know, you, you are pulling out, you know, what, what, I, what I do with this thing, I, I jokingly say, and it's truthful, that I squeeze all the art out of this I can. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, even though I'm a, a handyman and, you know, a, a theater, I was a tech director, I can fix and build anything. I'm actually kind of a technologically challenged. Which turns out to be to your advantage. Well, to to yeah. my advantage yeah. with this, I mean, this has three settings, close, closer, closest. And, uh, you know, what, what you see is what you get. Um, I don't do any uh, post uh, manipulation of a scene. I'll occasionally, you know, knock a cigarette butt out of the thing. But, uh, you know, I don't really know, you know, uh, Photoshop, I don't know how I would mm -hmm. begin to, yeah, you, you know, do, know do that, again. and I don't want to know it. I think it, uh, I, again, you know, this is everyday life. You know, why alter it if the image doesn't work? You delete it. You know, it's not uh, not an expensive process. It's cheap. We just have a couple of minutes left. I want to finish by talking about how you get your art out into the world. Yeah. So you are active in going to places like Muddy Waters right. and saying, hey, you got an empty wall, right. I've got right. some great art right. to put up there. Tell me a little bit about what you think is the, the future for artists to get their work out to the Boy, people that's who want it. to buy that's, it. You know, I, th I think uh, it, it depends what you want to do with your art. I mean, I uh, happened upon just an idea of these uh, art cards, uh, you know, a little five by seven. I chose my fa favorite image, here's cake, a popular, uh, the Busy Bee in Ventura, and this way I could hand 
the images to anybody. Mm -hmm. It's it's like a business card mm -hmm. rather than you know my name. And a great and, one, yeah. And a great one. You know, I jokingly again say to people, "Do you have a refrigerator at home? You know, go hang this on your fridge." This way, the more people that can see the image, the more it becomes mm -hmm. familiar. I've been doing this uh, mm -hmm. maybe a year and a month. Um, and already, I think uh, you know it's about branding, branding the image. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, if if the art stays in your studio, uh, it stays in your studio. The images are you know you're holding stuff close to the chest. And I I, th I really think you know if you have something that you want to share, share it. Um, I you know walk around. I'm. Uh, I would say moderately aggressive. You know, people go, oh, you're overexposed, you're everywhere. You know, if I go past any place that has a blank wall, I'll go well, in. I can't have yeah, a fish well, exa <laughs> exactly. You know, sometimes they'll go, well, you know, it's a, it's a, a you know, Mexican restaurant. I don't know how appropriate this will be with, you know, the, the bullfighting scenes. But a lot of people, you know, and as a thank you, you just, you know, Give them the five by seven card. Thank you for taking the, the couple minutes. You know, a receptionist or a, you know somebody at the counter that says the manager's out. You know, just go here and uh, you know everybody goes, oh, how cool! And so you know, so so things happen. It's a little gift. Yeah. You know, it's a gift. And you know, uh, I remember as a, a young man in Berkeley, uh, I was going to school and this guy gave me a card that said. Uh, if you want results, you got to make calls, or you got, you know, uh, s something to that fact. And you know, you need to put it out there. And you know, if you do, if you, you know, throw it out to the universe, I think something's something good will happen. And that's a, you know, that's yeah. a, that is an ideal way to, on which to end this interview. It's been a real pleasure. To oh, it's been you, been great. Been, Thank you so been much. great. Again, it's uh, always fun to you know. Uh, intellectual uh, banter over something that's uh, visually uh, oriented. So again, I appreciate your time and uh, we'll look forward to seeing yeah, your work yeah. out in the world. Excellent, excellent. And you'll recognize it all because of the okay. little boots, the boots <laughs> Thank there. You. Thank you very much. Our next guest of the day is Alana Tillum owner and co-director of Santa Barbara Dance Arts. Let's head over to Cesar Chavez to meet Alana. seen around town recently. <laughs> for a lot recently, yeah. but for a long time. Yeah, and, and the reason for that, of course, is that you're moving from this nice space um, over on uh, Cesar Chavez to a nicer space. Yes. Uh, East Coast. Tell us about that move. Well, you know, it's been a long journey for us. We've been in business for 16 years now, and I think we sort of thought that Cesar Chavez would be our home for many years. Uh, we were recorded into this building by the owner and the redevelopment agency and um, it appears that the landlord has chosen to repurpose the building. Um, there's a lot of changes in the funk zone and I think we're a bit of a, a casualty of these shifts as you know buildings are growing and changing and so it became evident that we needed to find a new home. So we did a two-year exhaustive search uh, with the help of Dave Pintard at Invest Tech was fabulous and we found our dream space. And it's at 531 East Coda Street. It's in the same block as Girls Inc., Santa Barbara Junior High, just a couple short blocks from Santa Barbara High School, um, Transition House. So a lot of you know, programs that we work with and serve um, are right in our block. It's a standalone building. It's almost 9,000 square feet. And it's basically a shell right now, but with the help of the community and donors, we've been able to um, you know, mount an amazing fundraising effort to help make this happen. And uh, it's gonna be a state of the art, brand new facility. And um, you know, Stephen and I always say this isn't just our space, this is the community space. And we're looking forward to being just 
in a neighborhood downtown, which in some ways I think will serve us far better than our funk zone beginnings did mm -hmm. um, and really allow us to have access to so many more people and help them. So when you say an amazing fundraising campaign, you are getting, I mean, it's just been, it's a lot of money, right? Yeah, it was a daunting task. I mean, we're sort of faced with, you know, you have, uh, you know, six months to a year to fundraise half a million dollars to make this happen. Because, you know, of course we have to do seismic upgrades mm -hmm. and, you know, go through all the city hoops to really make this, you know, not only a state of the art space, but a safe and sound space for many generations to come. So um, thus far we've raised almost $400,000. So um, it's been a combination of angel donors. We've had um, Michael Tobes is generously donating. We have the Sokolov family. Um, David Beaver and Renee Beaver have contributed. So we've had a combination of angel donors with um, just that sheer multitude of families that give. 50 bucks or 100 bucks or something. <laughs> yeah, and it really, it takes a village. I mean, we literally had almost 100% participation from our performance companies and it's really from you know families that are low income you know just contributing five dollars because they felt they wanted to be a part of this mm -hmm. and to me that donation is just as important as someone who's coming in at the fifty thousand dollar level because as i said this isn't just our space it's the community space and every little bit helps so if someone out there is watching and they're saying, well, I would like to donate five or $50,000, mm -hmm. how might they do that? Well, the great thing is we still have so many naming opportunities available. So there is that wonderful opportunity to have a legacy um, at this space. So whether it's in the form of you know, naming a studio or um, having a tile on our legacy wall, um, or if there's a trade or service, you know, right now construction broke ground on Friday. So whether you're a tradesman or have something like that, there's ample opportunities for your business or you know, family to be recognized. And the best way to give is to, you can log on to www.ampsb.org. Amp, and, and, yeah, so, okay. and so there's a link to um, givezooks.com, which is an amazing online giving platform. Mm -hmm. So it's so user friendly. You can click right on it, you can, you know, there's renderings of the building. Um, there's the opportunity to see when you click give, you can see how many different you know, ways there are to give. Um, and you know, it's just a great way to also see the progress we've made thus far. Well, let's, let's go back in time. Uh, you and Stephen Lovelace are the, the co-directors of the um, Santa Barbara Dance Arts. But when you started out in college, you were just working your own way through <laughs> and, and weren't even a dance major. Yeah, I had danced and trained in a studio growing up my entire life. And um, I was putting myself through school and being a dance major is so demanding on your time. You know, I, I always wanted to do both, but it just really was a choice that I really just, I was committed to my academic majors. But the dance department's so generous and uh, they allowed me to still take classes with majors and really keep that in my life. Because it was, I mean, a dance is so vital, not just for, you know, physical exercise, but also as just that release and that, you know, mental well-being. And so um, it was at that time that I met Stephen and he was substituting for a professor on maternity leave and we just really connected right away. And, you know, through that we began working together and, you know, it blossomed into a beautiful partnership. And it's, um, you know, we, we rented from other studios, sort of grew and grew and grew until eventually it was clear, you know, financially it was time for us to spread our wings and have our own space, which is sort of what brought us to Cesar Chavez. And um, so we've really grown baby steps bit by bit. You know, we initially shared the lease with Arts Alive. They subsequently, unfortunately, went out of business. They were a visual arts business. Um, and as, when they went out of business, we sort of had to assume this huge lease. But it allowed the program to grow. And um, now, you know, here we are going into another space that's even bigger than where we are now. And um, looking forward to see, you know, what we can do next. And it'll be so nice to be focusing on just growing some of these newer programs we have mm -hmm. instead of focusing on relocating a dance studio. Because, you know, and I think what's one thing that's important to mention is that, you know, we have our for profit Santa Barbara Dance Arts, but when we did take the step to move to Cesar Chavez, Stephen and I felt it was important to give back. And so we started a nonprofit called the Arts Mentorship Program. So we're the founders but we have you know, an executive director and a board of directors that have really been at our side every step of the way um, in this capital campaign. Because really, this is gonna be the arts mentorship program in dance arts 
Performing Arts Center. It's not, you know, I said it takes a whole community to bring this thing together. And that allows any donations to be tax deductible, which is incredible. One of the things that I, I like so much about Santa Barbara Dance Arts are programs like No Limits, mm -hmm. um, which you just started. Just it, started. Just had the first uh, meeting this yeah. week. Yeah, just this last week we had a um, No Limits is a program that uh, I started and it's basically working with, uh, it's a, it's a non-threatening and non-competitive environment. And so, you know, our program at Dance Arts is really geared towards kids that want to grow inside of the program. So even the recreational dancer can really see growth and progress and they're working towards, you know, little milestones and goals as they matriculate through the program. Now, No Limits is about saying, hey, I just want to dance and have fun. So I think so many kids are self-conscious or maybe they struggle with weight or you know esteem issues. This is a great place to come as you are and what we really think that this is wonderful for is children with special needs. So we have a great relationship with some of the organizations in town uh, for Down syndrome and we're reaching out to the autistic community and even you know disabled uh, wheelchair. We're just trying to really expand it so that way there's opportunity to be inclusive. And we had our first uh, class on uh, last Tuesday, we had 12 young people of all ages and abilities, and it was fabulous. And they had such a good time, and it was just fun. Yeah, well, I know that having a good time is really crucial to what you want to do. Here. Yeah. As you and I are talking here in the yellow room, yeah. uh, over in the pink studio, um, there's a, a master class right. going on, and that's another thing that you do, especially during the summer, right? Yeah, well, during the summer, I have an intensive summer camp. So it's geared towards the recreational student, but also geared towards the student that is you know, pursuing auditioning for that dance team or the college audition or our dance companies here. And we get even kids that are in theater that come in that want to really brush up on their dance skills. And the fact that we have a program that's nine to five serves working families. And the fact that it's that long, it allows you to really change and transform, you know, in this matter of time. And we have many students that attend eight and 10 weeks. I do something special the week of 4th of July, which is where I bring in talent from outside of Santa Barbara and I give them an opportunity to work with master teachers. So for example, yesterday we had uh, the winners of America's Best Dance Crew on MTV here. Oh, and we had superstars <laughs> from So You Think You Can Dance here today and that were here yesterday. And it really, you know, Santa Barbara is such a small town, but I think it's important for them to, to get exposure to talent and opportunity outside of this. And a lot of it isn't just the classes, but these teachers talking to them and inspiring them to, you know, achieve their goals. One of our teachers yesterday that came in, I mean, he's an attorney, practicing attorney in San Francisco, California, and then, you know, in LA on the weekends at the most prestigious dance studios in the country. So I think how they speak to the importance of you know, developing their careers and um, opportunities for them for dance. I think is it's great for them to start achieving and visioning their own goals and dreams. You know, because these experiences right here can be so transformative for them. You know, to see their idols and their heroes at their home studio, yeah, teaching them, yeah. you know, is and just... everyone was posing for pictures yesterday. Oh my goodness, <laughs> it was like the paparazzi, you know, and the kids were so nervous. I mean, these really are their heroes. Right and idols, which is incredible to be able to bring the kids um, their their own idols and bring them here. And I think the teachers that we love to not only bring up once, but continue to bring back, I think really help them find the balance of understanding that, you know, it's great that you look up to me, but also it's important that you understand that, you know, you know I'm a good person too. Right. And it's important, you know, the celebrity culture is something that we're always trying to, you know, Just break down. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, dance, you know, before So You Think You Can Dance, you know, there was, the, the celebrity dance culture didn't exist. And now, because of that show and dance moms, you know, love them or hate them, you know, they've really created a culture of celebrity and dance. And I think that's very appealing to kids. But we, you know, we want to grab them. Yeah, and we want to, but we want to keep them grounded too, because at the end of the day, you know, 15 minutes of fame isn't what's going to pay your bills or, or you know, keep you or keep you happy lifetime. for your lifetime and make sure they're understanding that it's, you know, being a dancer is work and it takes so much discipline and, and that there's so many opportunities to keep it in your life, whether you're an engineer or whether you decide to be a professional. Well, you do have uh, four dance companies that, that you sponsor, mm -hmm. and in just a second, we're going to take a, a look at it. Yeah. But tell, tell us about them. Well, the you know arts mentorship program and Santa Barbara Dance Arts have a true, um, you know, partnership. 
um, in the legal sense and in the logistic sense and in the heart sense. And I always say that dance arts is sort of the brain and AMP is the heart. And, you know, company is such a wonderful example of this. They train at Santa Barbara Dance Arts with these amazing teachers that we have, um, Broadway veterans and international professionals. Um, and then they get to learn repertory, which is their work that they perform. And it's really focusing and honing in on their artistry mm -hmm. and mentoring them on skills such as lighting and costuming, developing their own work. So company kind of brings all these things together and culminates in their very own show. And these kids sell out five shows over two weekends, and that's wow. configuration. Yeah. And it's a, it's a compilation of work set by professional faculty members and student work that's really mentored from start to finish. And, they and there's a range of work within configuration. Obviously. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, dance really tells a story. And over the years, we've had pieces that tell story of things that are, you know, wistful and, you know, just about joy and family um, to pieces that take a more serious look into topics like abuse or, um, you know, I lost my father last year. So I did a piece about you know, grief, mm -hmm. and I did this relocation and losing your father at the same time. Mm -hmm. I did a piece about getting through your hardest moment, and it didn't start with pirouettes or PKs. It started with all of us sitting in a room and talking about that most vulnerable moment we've ever had, mm -hmm. and it really bonded us all together as, you know, humans. Well, and those are the moments where great art is made, right? Absolutely. Really kind of going down and the everybody's quiet. crying yeah. and, and everybody's sharing and being vulnerable. And I think that's when dance becomes an art form that can really communicate mm -hmm. and transform people. And it was actually the first year that we did um, environmental work. I worked with a videographer and we did a film and we went out to the beach because the idea came to me when I was walking on the beach and a, a bird flew over and it, like I just felt my dad's presence so strong mm -hmm. and I was like I should do something out here so the whole piece is sort of juxtaposed with this beautiful black and white artistic film with the girls dancing on the beach mm -hmm. and that's in the background as they're dancing on the stage and they each had a piece of it for me my story had to do with grief and the challenges of saving this business to each of these girls it was their own personal narrative and it was just such a holistic experience and these young ladies in junior high and high school just, I think it transformed all of us. And I think that's such a wonderful gift to be able to, to help me. I mean, at the end of the day, it helped me the mm -hmm. most. You know, mm -hmm. I feel, you know, selfish, <laughs> you know, because at the end it's so rewarding and it really did help me heal. Um, but I think it's, it's just beautiful that it's healing for these kids too. And it's a wonderful outlet for them and keeps them in line as well. Because, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, when you're spending hours and hours rehearsing and, and in class and, you know, really treating your body as this temple, you know, it leaves little room for, you know, shenanigans. Yeah. Well, let, let's take a, a quick peek at, at, at some of the... Yeah, let's do that. So that's great. I mean, to see 
the kids out there and just doing the spectacular work. Mm -hmm. We just have a few minutes left. I, I'd like to talk about a few more things. Sure. Uh, rent subsidy is something that, that you guys are involved with. You know, I feel like that's the place where the arts mentorship program in Santa Barbara Dance Arts becomes sort of the unsung heroes of Santa Barbara. Uh, the rent subsidy program is something that Stephen and I came up with because as renters ourselves from studios, space is so expensive. You know, market price is anywhere from $35 to $85 an hour. And if you look at Santa Barbara, the fabric of Santa Barbara's culture is fiesta, it's solstice, it's the French festival, it's Earth Day. Um, and all of these amazing performance venues don't necessarily pay the dancers. You know, you don't get paid to be in the solstice parade or pay to be even the spirit of fiesta. It's something that, you know, you have to dedicate your own time and resources. And so we have an opportunity where the artists can get a subsidy and get affordable space to help them further their work and what they're doing. So we've provided affordable rehearsal space to um, generations and spirits of Fiesta and Junior Spirits, um, Solstice performers, but also we're the anchor um, you know, support for Boxtails of Santa Barbara, the executive directors have, and you know, artistic directors have said Boxtails wouldn't exist. Great company, yeah. Amazing, so they wouldn't exist without us. So they're in residence here, here. Ballet Santa Barbara. Um, and then I think the greatest thing is you have many biz, uh, business people like Lisa Beck, who is an amazing local drummer and dancer. And she started on the rent subsidy and no longer needs it. Now she has a sustainable program of classes. So I believe it helps the economy of Santa Barbara and it helps local artists get a start. Yeah. And then I think it also really helps support this like amazing vital cultural festivals that sort of make Santa Barbara so special. And um, this opportunity to have affordable space is huge. And we've even had organizations like Food Bank or Teddy Bear Cancer Foundation do events with us as well because at the end of the day, it's just a great space. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, you know, I think it's great that people hear more about that, that we're here for that. Well, finish up by telling us about your own classes. You just yeah. The classes oh, everybody about. else does. Yeah. Well, you know, here at Dance Arts, we have classes from kids ages three to adults that are in their 80s. And so we have a full menu of classes, everything from jazz and hip hop and Broadway to the um, aerial like Cirque du Soleil and um, let's see, ballet, contemporary. So we have a full spectrum of classes and um, all kids are welcome. And we just, and adults as well are so welcome. SBDanceArts.com. Yeah, www.sbdancearts.com. Uh, well, it gets you signed up. Our, uh, we're in the middle of our summer camps with space available. And then we have our classes starting in the fall and they're already filling up, so. Okay. And, we, and so we want to make one final pitch for people to who have five or fifty thousand dollars to, yeah. to to pitch in and help. Yeah, absolutely. Space, yeah. So you know, if anybody wants to contribute to our capital campaign, go visit ampsb.org uh, and click on the link to view the building, and you can find out how you can be a part of our campaign, which is called Building Dreams from the Ground Up. And we know we can do it with your help. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Helen. Thank you so much. And our final guest this time is artist Ed Lister. Let's go inside Ed's studio and meet him. Hey there, Ed. Hey, David. Good to see you. Good to meet you. Yeah. Come on in. Well, we're, we're seated comfortably in your old kitchen chairs here, Ed. <laughs> Hand painted. Yeah, the, uh, I think I may got a little paint on my, <laughs> my jeans there. Um, this is a, it's a great, great space that you have. How'd you get it? Um, well, we sold the house about two years ago where I had a, a nice studio um, and uh, I put an ad in the uh, local paper and somebody phoned and said, you know, there's a, a, a studio space available in Montecito, reasonable rate. Are you interested? I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll yeah. take it. So it's a little bit on the dark side, but we got Northern Light, and which seems to be important to some mm -hmm. painters. Um, I'm very familiar with the colors I use, so I don't, uh, that's not super critical. But it's uh, uh, you know a workable space, and I can uh, stretch my imagination here. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, we're going to talk about kind of the the broad spectrum of your work. I, I know that you began by doing scenic painting for uh, all sorts of different things. How, well, how did you get? How did you find your way to that? Well, when I came over from England in the seventies, I was working in TV because it was a good income. Mm -hmm. you know, very well paid for what you did. And the same union, it had to become a union job, the same union 
represented film, TV, and uh, theater. Mm -hmm. Well, TV was the, the lowest level of the grading, as it were, and the, the theater was the more pure, traditional type of painting for um, backdrops, theatrical feelings, and so forth. And I fell into that at uh, the Taper downtown in LA, and I ended up within a year or so of just running the place, the scenic, that is, the scenic painting. And I got to know um, a, a lot about large-scale painting. The uh, Taper was one of the show uh, theaters we had to paint for. And the sight lines there, because it was a first stage, mm -hmm. the sight lines, the people sitting on either side of the horseshoe, were like about 150 feet of, of backdrop. So that was a pretty That's big a backdrop. Paint, yeah, yeah see, a lot of paint. And um, I, you, know, you know, if you paint and you've got an eye for painting, you can sort of scale up and work on a larger scale. I found it very easy to paint that size. And I really liked painting big. It was 40 foot high, I think, and 130 foot odd wide. And, you know, somebody had to paint it. It was a union job. I got in people who knew what they were doing, and I was um, spry enough to sort of observe what they were doing. And after a while, I left that and became freelance in the movie business and TV commercial downtown in LA. And, and that was uh, not quite as intellectually as stimulating as the true theater, but it was um, vibrant in that it was immediate, mm -hmm. it was very demanding, and it was on a deadline. And it's great if you're working on a deadline, it sort of powers you through and you get a much more dynamic image. And I was doing big skies and uh, there's one up there which is uh, a sketch for a, a, an art director who wanted a hundred and... This oh, is in Japan, right? No, no, they, oh. the, it was a Japanese commercial over here. Oh, okay. Because uh, they love to get on an expense account and come to Hollywood, you see, <laughs> and play golf. But anyway, it was uh, 400 feet, three sides of a stage at MGM. And uh, that was 40 foot high. So it was quite a few thousand square feet. And not only good money, but it had to be out in a week. So it was very dynamic. You had to really punch it out. So you have a team out. of assistants, I assume. Helped yeah, I, yeah. But I mean, I do a lot of the painting myself, mm -hmm. obviously. But it it was, um, yeah, it was a team effort. Yeah. But so I mean, that that was exciting work. Um, and what, what are some of the other particular things that you worked on that you still think, oh man, I can't believe I did this or that? Um, well, I worked with some of the better directors from Hollywood because they found out that uh, uh, they could make very, very good money doing TV <laughs> commercials. And uh, a, a film would be like a six month, eight month project for them as well as for, for the seating artists. But if you did a TV commercial, it was over in a week and the money was really far good. better. Yeah. Really, but, and that was the driving force. The, the, uh, uh, not only the money, but the, the dynamic of having, having to get it out in a week. And uh, that's what we did. So you were doing uh, desert scenes for cars? Anything. Um, and stuff like yeah, that? desert scenes. Anything which about ultimately was taken over by um, uh, either green screen or a computer. Mm -hmm. you know, it was a lot easier and cheaper to press a button and have a nice landscape behind mm -hmm. the car or uh, whatever the subject matter was of the commercial. So that meant that we had to rethink our uh, approach to painting. I came up here to Santa Barbara in the mid 90s and about that time was when computers took over from what I used to paint. This is uh, nothing to do with theater now because it, that, that's another story that was, that was further back in, in, in chronological times. But the, um, the fact that I was up here and not getting jobs from LA I took very personally, but in fact, it was it was just the nature of the, the business. Was just yeah. Changing, yeah. So I, I did a um, I broadened my landscape, and I I did jobs back east for uh, casinos and hotels. Um, one of the bigger ones I did was for the Mohegan Casino in Connecticut. Mm. The last of the, the Mohegans actually <laughs> there were about ten of them, and they they had some land, so they put up a casino, and I painted uh, some really big uh, murals for that. Uh, that was a huge job. Well, we have a, a lot of video of, of you uh, and, a, and a mural here in town, which is really important. Tell, tell us about that. Oh, that. well, about two or three years ago, I got a call from um, Faye Bisno, who's the wife of Dr. Bisno. Dr. Bisno and Dick Scholl, who lives in Montecito, had got together and they had uh, uh, and seen the clockwork within the clock room of the clock tower. And they thought it was, uh, it was a Seth Thomas clock, and they thought it needed a greater exposure that they would turn it into a little museum. Pre previous to that, it had been um, a broom closet full of 
paints and janitorial supplies, but it, it was a lovely piece of uh, mechanism for, for, for clockwork. Designed in, uh, gosh, I think in the last previous century, I should say, the 19th century. And um, what they decided to do was, was clean the inside out, turn it uh, into a small museum with access for people who come to visit the top of the tower, you know, to see the view. And um, so it's pretty well described to them how the time evolved, how the keeping of time evolved, clocks evolved, um, timekeeping, right from early uh, uh, imagery like, uh, which I illustrated, um, Egyptian water clocks, Chinese clocks, uh, the first clocks in uh, the Roman times, you know, just a, a drip from a, a bucket of water would tell the time, candle clocks, and how it went through the Age of Enlightenment, essentially. This is the, the back wall, the west wall. And um, how uh, quite a few of the um, technical pieces of the clock were invented by, as it happened, English people. Um, there's Thomas uh, Tompion, uh, 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 George Graham, John, John Harrison you may know about. He's a brilliant um, carpenter from England who, in fact, uh, devised a way of finding where longitude was. How um, he devised and built a clock, he, bought, he built four clocks in his lifetime. And uh, the final one won the competition for the most accurate clock, which the Navy at the time wanted a very accurate way of me making time, so that the ship would know where it was on the high seas. Well, you know, you're, you're, it's a, that big tradition of historical murals, I mean, that I think of from the, the, the WPA, the 30s and stuff like that. This is not WPA. This had to be more of an educational yeah, thing. Yeah, but I'm thinking that, that one of the things that they tried to do was to, to tell a historical story in, in the images that they're Yeah. Out. Yeah, well, I, you know, these are not WPA times. And my brief by Dr. Bisno was, um, could I paint something which would, you know, school kids come by and they say, well, what's that? And the docents there have to be boned up on, on what that is. Right. There's about 80 or 100 different images scattered from uh, uh, left to right is about 60 feet of imagery. And they all had a reason to be there, how time came with the Spanish to the missions and how um, there was no real need for a clock, but there was a need for, for telling of time, i.e., you know, come to prayer, go work, mm -hmm. eat. Um, so the church bell was the, was the representation of a clock at that time. The Spanish didn't actually have clocks here. But they had a, a, the bell system and that uh, led to the keeping of time and uh, the pattern of the day. To what extent were you kind of given, you must touch these bases, and, and what leeway did you have to kind of... Um, I was given, uh, initially I was given, um, I was research, you know, a whole bunch of books by Dr. Bisner, <laughs> very enthusiastic. Um, and the more I read, the more I had to include um, stuff which I didn't know about. I mean, the... Uh, uh, Fleming, the guy who's a Scottish engineer who did the Trans-Canadian Railway, he realized that there's going to be a problem if there's no time uh, rationale from East Coast to West Coast. If you don't have a, a, a time zone system, trains will actually meet on the same track going you know, towards each other. In fact, in, uh, I think in the 1850s in uh, Albany, you could be on a platform station, it'll say Boston time, New York time, and Buffalo time, and they're all different. So he had to rationalize it. This is Fleming. This is one little item. He's in the, in the mural. Mm -hmm. He's up there. And um, we uh, arrived at 1929, which is when the clock tower went up. And that's, that was the, the end of the story. Because after that, the, um, the clock became less visually interesting and became an atomic clock, which was in the gray box. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it made a timely finish in, in 1929. So we got... Uh, pictures of, of mass-producing clocks in Connecticut with Seth Thomas. We got uh, Lindbergh. He, he has a connection with, uh, this is the, the uh, Spirit of St. Louis, which was built in Long Beach, but was financed by Mrs. Knight, who was a, a, from St. Louis, but she had a place in Montecito. So that was the Montecito yeah, connection. Yeah. So that gave me a little bit of imagery coming back into, into the 1920s and, and uh, connects that way. So I, I was looking for sort of uh, not only uh, 
uh, circular movements that keep the whole imagery rolling because you've got 60 foot long mm -hmm. by only seven foot high. Um, how do you keep the eye wandering uh, from left to right? I don't know about you, when I go into a museum or a gallery, I always go to the left and head right. I guess I do. Too. I, it's a bit like, like writing a letter. So in a sense, it was um, Stonehenge, um, the Egyptian water clocks, Chinese, back in the almost dark ages, although they were very informed about how to do all this, that's on the left, and you sort of read through to the right, coming up to the 20th century on the right, uh, on the right hand side. Well, it's a, a spectacular achievement to people who haven't uh, seen it. Good to go down there. It's open. Um... It's open twice. Uh, well, I'm not sure the, the, the timing. The, it, because of the machinery, you know, children tend to put little fingers in little. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I'm not sure the liability insurance covers that, but they, they, it will be a docent led, I think, twice a day. Um, or, of course, by um, appointment, but I think 10 and 2 o'clock. I could be wrong on that, but uh, it'll be escorted because it, it's, it's got a glass wall you can see in, but you can't go in, and you won't be led by a docent until those times. Right, okay. Well, let's, let's, let's segue from that to, um, to your studio here. I mean, we're in the midst of, of, of blue right now on, on either side of us, and there's, as we look beyond the camera, there are a lot of seascapes. Uh, tell me about them. Well, I guess it's my English background. I, I've always lived close to water, and coming here to Santa Barbara, with, you know, within um, stones throw of, of the oceans. These are the um, the seascapes I saw from my um, the deck of my house, um, and I painted that. I, you know, I was just an observer of, of the tides of day and the uh, atmospheres, and uh, the underwater paintings are since I left that house. So, in other words. Having sold the house, we moved into an apartment, and therefore it's, it's uh, not claustrophobic, it's just that it's when well, horizons close in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became very interested in the, um, uh, the, the swimmers when they had the water polo at the Olympics, how between scoring, when they all swim back to their ends, they're all sort of pulling at each other's underwear and so forth. But <laughs> um, it, it, the, the, Figures in limbo, I found really fascinating. Yeah. So these are halfway through. Um, they eventually go as blue as that down there. Well, yeah, I mean, we can we we walked in uh, your their process, which is kind of working with these little dots, right? Well, it's just a spatter. Yeah, it's a, it's a way of without using a brush. I didn't want to tell the story of, of the painting with a brush. I wanted to keep it a step back. So this will build up into a of solid blue like that, with a, a continual spatter of, of, of little drops of colour. And you of course uh, can change the, the hues so that uh, towards the bottom here, for instance, you're getting um, a little bit of red coming through. Going down making the bottom of the pool here. Yeah. Well, to the bottom of the, yeah, to the pool. Yeah. Pretty spectacular. So, and, and they're big too. I mean, this seems to echo back to your work with... Yeah, exactly. I like, I like to work big and... Um, uh, I relish uh, you know, commissions which are on the larger size, and this I don't have any plans for, but I just wanted to do it big. This is uh, 10 foot by 8 foot. Well, when you, when you think back here now, you're, you're still a, a, an active painter, but you've had a, a, a long, illustrious career. What, 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 well, illustrious. <laughs> <laughs> what, what else do you want to do? I mean, you, you're, uh, we're looking at, 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 at water. Is that something that you think will continue on? I mean, I know it's hard for any artist to predict what uh, their passions will become, but what do you think? Well, I'll, I'll strain this for, for what it's worth because I, you know, I'm fascinated by it. There's always something different happening underwater and it's very difficult to paint. And I'm not totally there yet with this one, for instance. I'm still, when I come in in the morning, I go, oh, gee, you know, maybe I'll change this or change that. So um, it's a painterly process. Usually when I'm painting uh, skies or, or given artwork, um, I'll do what's given to me, boom, switch it off and it's done. Mm -hmm. Whereas the painting's here to annoy me all the time just by its presence. So I tend to come in and pick at it and change it. And that you sounds like a, a seven lot. day cycle on this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been up for some time. What I'd like to do is sort of like fold it up and forget about it for a few months, but it's there. It's too big to do that. So I'm, I'm uh, forever sort of making changes. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which is part of the painting process. I think we just have a, a minute or two left. I'd, I'd love to hear you give a word of advice to any viewers. What would you say to a young artist, someone who's considering their career in art? I'd, I'd learn to walk before running. There's so many painters who, bless their hearts, they, they go running in full tilt and they don't have the skills or the knowledge or the basics of really knowing how to draw. I think drawing is absolutely critical to the first few years of uh, an artist's life. He's got to know that he can draw and knowing that structure can be a basis for any other um, artistic en endeavor, painting-wise. Um, you've, you've got to have the confidence. You've got to know that you can do it. So thanks again, Ed. The Creative Community is produced with a generous grant from the Diane and Simon Robb Foundation. I'm David Starkey. Thanks for watching.